Good afternoon, everybody. It's such a great pleasure for me to be here today uh, with you, especially looking forward to the presentation by Chris McWilliams. Pfizer has been very active for many years in green chemistry and always have been inspired and, and very much admired the great work that they've been doing. We happened to see a version of this talk at our conference past July, and we asked Chris to come and do a reprise of that, and I'm just so excited that he could be here with us today. I often like to use this chart, the periodic table. First of all, as a chemist, everyone knows about this, and this is probably a presentation that you're not familiar with, or perhaps you may have seen it before, but it's showing relative abundances or critical supply of elements that we know and love. Just focus your attention to the very center, to the platinum group. These are clearly metals that have had an enormous impact in chemistry. We use them all the time. We rely on them very heavily, but they are elements that in the future we are increasingly going to struggle to supply without a huge economic and environmental cost. We have been interested in providing presentations to, to the chemistry community about this and strategies and alternatives to these particular metals. So with that introduction, I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to Chris. And Chris, thanks so much for being here today and making this presentation. Great. Thank you, David. I'd like to start by going over what I would hope you would take home as learnings from the webinar listed here on this slide. Metal catalyzed cross-coupling is a key transformation in the pharmaceutical industry, and it still relies predominantly on palladium. What you'll see is that base metals offer many advantages of palladium and other precious metals and are often superior to, in performance to palladium. And so they shouldn't be just considered a placement for, but actually as a first approach. And lastly, that you'll see some examples of where base metals offer new modes of reactivity and as a consequence, new disconnections and ways to assemble molecules. Let's go on to show you why you might be, should be considering iron and nickel the next time you run a cross-coupling reaction. This slide is a, a version of an article written by a Lilly chemist, Tony Zhang, in 2006. And it's a really interesting article if you're either getting into process chemistry or are still are interested in process chemistry. And what it shows at the top is a typical drug development progression from early discovery through clinical phase development and ultimately if that's successful to a submission and filing and then launching and marketing of a, an approved drug. Throughout this process, chemists must assemble those new drugs through synthetic reactions. And what these pentagonal interconnected diagrams represent is the kind of high value uh, attributes that chemists usually see in the types of reactions that they use. In both early and late phase, in discovery and, and development, safety, of course, is, is number one. Safety to the chemist in the lab, safety to the personnel working in the scale facilities, and ultimately safety to the patient themselves. In the early discovery phase, the focus, you're, you're really looking at many molecules to find that one unique molecule with the right properties to hit your target profile of that particular program. And so you need reactions and synthetic routes that give you a lot of speed to get to those various compounds. It needs to have, often you want to have a broad scope so you can make many different compounds and apply it to many different structures. You'd like to have unique connections. You can build things faster and also enter a unique chemical space. As you transition to development, the focus changes a bit. You still have a focus on speed, especially with limited resources as well as cost, but as you're beginning to scale the reaction up and moving them to larger facilities and different facilities to manufacture the compound, there's more of a focus on robustness. You need reactions and processes that can be transferred from one vessel to another and scale up with confidence. Also, as you scale up, you have a bigger impact on the environment, so that becomes a key factor. As the program develops and you begin to make supplies that are going into patients, you are committing to a level of quality with the regulatory agencies, and you need to match that quality throughout the development and ultimately into manufacturing. So what kind of reactions are people using in the pharma industry? 
there's been a number of surveys in the medicinal chemistry field. And if you, this particular example is an amalgamation of two surveys that were done in a medicinal chemistry department. And you can see that palladium catalyzed cross coupling stands out as one of the top three transformations that is used in medicinal chemistry. Along with cross coupling, palladium is used for other transformations such as hydrogenations, hydrogenolysis, and and things like removing certain protection groups. Well, the impact of metal catalyzed cross coupling on society was recognized in 2010 with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry awarded to three of the pioneers of metal catalyzed cross coupling. And I list here several types of metal catalyzed cross coupling that most of you are probably familiar with. Is palladium catalyzed cross coupling used on large scale as well? This slide shows several Pfizer products that are commercialized. And you can see, I've noted where palladium is used either in cross coupling, but also in hydrogenations, hydrogenolysis, and there's also rhodium hydrogenation. You can see it's, it's prevalent. And although this is just a representation of some Pfizer products, I'm sure if you look at other pharma company portfolios, you'll see something very similar. So there was a survey in 2011 by a couple Pfizer process chemists, Magano and Dunitz, who looked at all of the published reactions that were done on scale, all the published cross-coupling, metal catalyzed cross-coupling reactions. And they found that the most often used was the Suzuki reaction, followed by the HEC. That's something very similar to what we see also coming out of medicinal chemistry and coming into early clinical. In fact, I would say this, the percentage of Suzuki reactions that come in come out of medicinal chemistry into development is probably much higher than what's shown here. On this slide, you'll see that actually 90% of the metal catalyzed cross-coupling reactions run on scale involve palladium catalysis. Only 10% of those are catalyzed by another metal other than palladium, and that's the nickel kumanas, which is not surprising given that nickel kumana, the kumana reaction is well precedent with nickel. In fact, the very first publication of the kumana reaction was with nickel. So the question you might be asking is, why do we run so many reactions with palladium, and why are we not choosing base metals instead? If you look back in history of the development of cross-coupling reactions, you'll actually see that nickel was fairly prominent early on arguably the first cross-coupling reaction ever published was the Kumana reaction in which Kumana showed that he could couple this aryl chloride with a nickel catalyst and an ethyl Grignard reagent to form ethyl benzene in high yield. And even the Nobel laureate Nagishi in one of his very early publications prior to discovering the reaction that he's named for, he was looking at a number of different transformations with metal catalysis. And in this particular one, he was looking at coupling alanes to aryl halides. And he also found and stated within the manuscript that there was really no advantage to using palladium, that nickel was as good or better than palladium. And you can see from the data there that the nickel catalyzed reaction runs at a lower temperature and is kinetically faster than the palladium reaction. So we'll take a moment to ask a question about what you think might be comparable costs of palladium versus some of the base metals. The number is actually quite low because the cost of palladium is much higher than nickel, copper, and iron. You can see by the graph on the left. And if you factor in the molecular weight, it essentially doubles that ratio. And so the amount of palladium, based on simply the market value for the pure metal required to be equal in cost to 1% loading, is at levels that are really impractical to attain on a normal pharmaceutical reaction intermediate. Of course, these are based only on the pure metal, and there are other cost factors that come into play when you're actually buying organometallic catalysts, such as the fabrication of the catalyst itself and the ligands. So, Regardless, you may not see this kind of difference in cost, but you will see, in every case, a very substantial difference in cost, and I'll show some examples later on. In terms of supply, palladium is much less abundant than nickel, copper, and iron. As a consequence, the production is also correspondingly less. Another thing that is a concern is that the risk of a continuous supply and the risk that 
the prices will be maintained at market rates that they might vary a lot in the market is relatively high compared to the base metals. And this is uh, measured by a supply risk index that was published by the British Geological Society in 2012. And this is based on a number of factors, but one of the primary bases is where the actual metal is mined and what's the likelihood of that location having some instability, either politically or otherwise, that would cause supplies to be reduced or be inaccessible. And you can see that an example here with palladium, even last year in the Wall Street Journal, they highlighted that the palladium had hit a 13-year high based on supply risk concerns due to uh, strikes that were occurring in South Africa. I would also note that I don't have the data in one of these slides, but over the last four or five years, the production of palladium has been steadily decreasing. And the demand for palladium is going in the opposite direction. And this is both literally and figuratively driven by an increase in demand for cars and automobiles and, of course, the, the necessary catalytic converters in rapidly developing countries such as China. So now let's compare the toxicity and environmental impact of palladium versus these three base metals. In this table, what I have here is the comparison of the oral exposure limits that are the guidance used by industry that permitted daily exposure allowable in a pharmaceutical drug. And you can clearly see that palladium is lower than both nickel and more so with copper and substantially so with iron. This is true with all routes of treatment, either inhalation, parenteral, or oral drugs. There's one caveat that I should note about nickel, and that nickel has been classified as a carcinogen by the International Agency for the Research on Cancer. And the basis of this is primarily studies on inorganic nickel compounds from inhalation studies of people working in the mining industry, such as the smelting industry. There's little or no data on organometallic complexes, and we're actually interested in pursuing that and understanding that further here at Pfizer. In terms of the carbon footprint, once again, you see that palladium has a much higher impact on the environment. What this is, is this the CO2 equivalents related to the amount of energy it takes to actually produce the purified metal from its raw natural state. And the reason why this number is so large for palladium is the actual content of palladium in the natural ore is very low. So it takes a two and a half ounces of palladium or less you get out of one ton of rock. It's also that palladium is downstream from the isolation of other metals such as nickel and copper. So after the nickel and copper is purified from the raw ore, the, what's remaining is then further treated to extract out and purify the palladium. Now let's take a moment to think about the comparison of reactivity of palladium versus nickel. So we're now sort of transitioning to the comparison of reactivity of palladium versus the base metals. And the answer to that question is that for given the same environment, the same ligands around the metals, nickel has a lower energy transition state compared to palladium. And as a consequence, it's more able to oxidatively add and thereby react with less reactive or stronger bonds. And this is kind of borne out on this slide here. If you look at the history of the nickel Suzuki Miura coupling, in 1979, Suzuki Miura published the first example of the reaction that would also be named after Suzuki and Miura in Syncom. And you could see already evidence of the difference between palladium and nickel. They had shown that the classic palladium tetracus triphenylphosphine catalyst was able to effectively couple the aryl bromides and iodides, but was unreactive under those conditions with the corresponding chloride. It then took 16 years before PERSEC actually published the very first nickel catalyzed Suzuki type reaction with aryl mesylase. And he also noted here that with palladium, the temperature required much significantly higher temperatures compared to the nickel complex, and he was able to achieve higher yields. It wasn't 
quite a head-to-head -head comparison because he was using larger quantities of nickel, but the reaction conditions were milder. Shortly thereafter, about a year after, and perhaps prompted by Persec's publication, Miura demonstrated that the Suzuki reaction could be achieved with aerochlorides if a nickel catalyst was used, and so there was a whole publication on that in 1996. After that, there was very sporadic publications on nickel catalyzed Suzuki until about 2008, 12 years later, when Chatani, Garg, and Shi began to publish some very interesting reactivity of nickel catalysts in which they could get what were thought to be unreactive carbon-oxygen bonds to oxidatively add to nickel and couple in the Suzuki and other types of reactions. This started a lot of publications in nickel catalyzed Suzuki and other reactions. And what I highlight here is one that was published by Hartwig in 2012 when he demonstrated not only a precatalyst that could rapidly enter the catalytic cycle, but he also showed that there was a breadth of reactivity across a number of heterocycles using very low catalyst loading at 0.5 mole percent, which was comparatively low relative to previous publications. It's not all roses with base metal catalysis, and there are reasons why base metal catalysis has not been pursued as uh, fervently, let's say, as palladium. And this slide shows a comparison of palladium and nickel that highlights one of the challenges. This is a comparison that was done within Pfizer in which the chemists had compared some recent palladium catalysts published by Buckwald and Zhao with some of the current best nickel catalysts at the time, the one by Hartwig and some internal conditions. And what you see is that as you go down the chart, palladium has a broader application, a broader breadth of reactivity to the substrates there and nickel is relatively unreactive and seems to get shut down. And in this case, these are NH heterocycles, which are very common in pharma and a desirable substrate to couple, but it's been shown by Buckle with palladium that the NH heterocycles tend to deprotonate and either form an equilibrium or an irreversible reaction with palladium. A hypothesis around nickel is that the same is true there, although the equilibrium it may be irreversible because it seems to completely shut down the reaction. Other examples where nickel doesn't have the breadth of palladium are things like nitro groups, which are reduced and deactivates the nickel catalyst. So essentially, with the current state of the catalyst available, nitro groups are incompatible for Suzuki reactions. Another challenge for base metals in general is that the reactions can be very complex. This can be thought of either a challenge or an opportunity, but what you see is that because the base metals can react in a number of different reaction manifolds involving one electron and two electron chemistry, unlike palladium, which tends to be usually straightforward two electron type of redox cycles, the base metals are engaging in a number of different reactive patterns, and as a consequence, you can often see side reactions that are out of control. And, and give you mixtures. Now, the opportunity is that if you can develop catalysts to work better, to follow one particular reaction pattern, that you would be able to develop new types of reactions. And that's what we see, we're see. we beginning to see in the literature, and that's highlighted by the reaction in the lower left, where Weichs has shown that the reductive coupling of uh, aryl halides with alkyl halides proceeds by a radical chain mechanism. And he's been able to use that to effectively assemble molecules in a different way than you would palladium. The answer, in short, is that, again, in the same environment, nickel would be less likely to undergo beta hydride elimination than palladium. One explanation of this is through, has been proposed through a computational study in which nickel, being less electronegative than palladium, has a weaker bond to the beta hydrogen weaker agostic interaction, and as a consequence, the migration of the hydrogen onto the nickel metal is a higher transition state compared to palladium. This has been used re very frequently recently in a number of transformations to an advantage in that you can now oxidatively add 
SB3 hybridized halides and couple those in a manner that efficiently gives you high yield to product. So a nice example of this is the work by Greg Fu in which he's able to take a racemic bromide and couple that with nickel in a stereo convergent manner to get a single enantiomer of the desired product in, in both high E and high yield. And we're seeing an, a number of those types of transformations beginning to show up in the literature. The reaction in the middle right here is another example highlighting the reactivity of nickel versus palladium in that, once again, you're seeing these unreactive methoxy ether bonds are able to oxidively add and couple effectively to the organic boron compound in a Suzuki-type reaction. Even more recently, there's been publications where a carbon fluoride bond has been used as the electrophilic partner. In the lower right, it highlights some iron chemistry in which the green yard, in the presence of the iron catalyst, is extremely fast reaction and reacts with the chloride in the presence of what would normally be considered a very reactive methyl ester. So let's move on to some pharma examples that highlight the benefits of base metal catalysis. This is a reaction which was a pretty standard Suzuki coupling with an aryl bromide and a boronic acid, and that was screened by the chemical technology group, and that group had looked at both nickel and palladium and found that a very simple nickel catalyst using triphenylphosphine gave high yields of the product in a kinetically rapid manner compared to this other palladium catalyst, which also gave a decent yield. But however, if you look at the two catalysts, the difference in cost is quite substantial. One might pose, why would you go with palladium when nickel works as good or better and is substantially cheaper? Here's another Suzuki reaction. And again, I, we see quite a few Suzuki reactions coming up into development from medicinal chemistry. And in this case, formation of a bronic acid, which will ultimately be used in a Suzuki reaction. And this reaction came in from a program in medicinal chemistry and had been using this uh, XFOS generation three palladium catalyst. And the yield was not great, but it was sufficient for a first delivery. However, the big problem was that at that time, there was actually insufficient commercial supplies anywhere in the world to buy enough catalyst to run this reaction on the scale that was desired. In a very short time, the project team had to find an alternative to these conditions or lower the catalyst loading to something that they could uh, scale up. And once again, submitted it to the chemical technology group at, in Pfizer Process Chemistry, and very quickly, that group found that the simple triphenylphosphate nickel catalyst at very low catalyst, uh, reasonable lower catalyst loading, let's say, was able to get a very high yield. This is based on a, a very recent publication by Gary Molander using nickel catalyst to couple bisboronic acid. The reaction conditions are also much milder, 20 degrees C versus 70 degrees C, and the yield is substantially higher. So this resulted in a process that was scaled, and it was a 90% reduction in cost. It was a simple and available catalyst system under much milder conditions. So once again, one might argue, why would you start with palladium catalysis with uh, one of these sort of generation three type catalysts when a very simple, uh, readily available nickel catalyst would work as well or better. This next example is yet another Suzuki reaction when it started in the first scale up supplies. It was a Suzuki reaction with this boronic ester derived from an aniline starting material. It was catalyzed by one of the old classic palladium catalysts, tetracus triphenylphosphine palladium. The actual yield of the reaction was not too bad. The real problem was that to remove the palladium to an acceptable level it required a very difficult series of processing steps that include uh, multiple treatments and ultimately resulted in, in a low, lower yield of product. So upon further development, the project team was looking for an alternative to this that would make not only the workup easier but make the reaction economical. Very quickly they found that nickel could couple that substrate in a Kumata type of reaction. So rather than forming the boronic ester from an intermediate similar to this, they would take that intermediate organometallic and couple it directly to the triazine chloride. The challenge here was that the yield was not too high at that point. And the chemist on the project had noted that there was a major byproduct in the reaction. The homocoupling 
dimer is forming the rest of the mass in the reaction. And this is not too uncommon for nickel, and it, and it highlights again the multiple reaction pathways that, that tend to be available for the base metals. This is presumably occurring through a disproportionation, which is very common with nickel, and to a lesser extent, typically with palladium. So how might you reduce the amount of dimer formed in this reaction? Well, there might be a number of ways, but what the project chemist did is he rationalized that if he keeps the concentration of the Grignard low, the rate of homocoupling will correspondingly decrease. And that's indeed what happened. So if he added this Grignard slowly by syringe pump, the yield substantially increased uh, the desired product and the homocoupling decreased. You always get a little bit of homocoupling due to the, when you're having a nickel-2 complex, when you start with that as the precatalyst because the Grignard is used to reduce the uh, nickel-2 complex down to a nickel-0. That was a good process, but later on they found that they could actually run the same Kumana reaction with a very simple catalyst using iron trichloride. So using 1% iron trichloride, the reaction was extremely rapid, able to achieve a 91% isolated yield. This has been produced on as much as 73 kilograms to date, and what you see here is a kinetic profile that was derived from a React IR experiment. And you can see for most of the reaction, the formation of the product is essentially dose controlled, so it's a very fast reaction. If you compare the original process with this new process, the new process is substantially better in every category. So first of all, you're eliminating an entire bond forming step. You no longer have to prepare the boronic ester, but go directly in with what is likely the precursor to the boronic ester. You're using now a, a simple inorganic catalyst, which is very inexpensive, versus a palladium catalyst with phosphine ligands. The conditions are much milder at 20 degrees, very fast versus elevated temperature, the yield is higher. One thing that might be undervalued or unappreciated is the removal of the metal itself. Pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of time worrying about the amount of residual palladium in processes that have uh, palladium cross-coupling. A lot of effort is made to remove the palladium, but also to prove to the regulatory agencies that you've met the specifications for palladium. With iron, the limit is very high, it's very non-toxic, and really, there's no need to, uh, in this case, there was no need to develop an analytical method or further testing to definitively prove that you're going to get consistently uh, low levels of iron to meet specifications, and the, the iron itself was washed out with a simple aqueous workup. This last example is actually from Genentech, and it came out uh, after the uh, review article that was written by Javier Magano and, and Dunitz. They also were looking at a Suzuki reaction on scale, and they compared palladium with nickel and found that after they evaluated the two different catalysts, the nickel was the catalyst of choice. It had a very simple phosphine ligand, as did the palladium, but it was a much cheaper catalyst. It was a, a substantial improvement in the yield over palladium, and they once again noted that the removal of the metal to get down to required low levels of residual nickel or palladium, in this case the nickel required only an aqueous ammonia wash to get it down to uh, target specifications, whereas the palladium required an additional functionalized phial silica treatment to remove palladium. Now, given the time, I think I'm going to bypass most of these, but I'll, they'll be in the presentation that you can download. What I'll only state is that there is uh, two groups, one from Pfizer and one from the Doyle group at Princeton. At the same time, realize that the current nickel pre catalysts that were used to screen and evaluate nickel chemistry were not ideal. And so they both independently developed this air-stable catalyst that can be used for a whole range of transformations, easily reduced and uh, converted to the corresponding phosphine or carbene catalyst. This has uh, been recently picked up by STREM, and anyone can buy that. And, and use that to test out nickel chemistry on their own. Lastly, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some, some interesting chemistry that is of particular inter interest to Pfizer because it, it eliminates a full step in uh, the coupling of two halides. What, this is the 
reductive coupling that's been de developed by the Weichs group. And this chemistry is essentially can couple two electrophiles by in situ reduction of one. Well, this is, this is going through the radical chain mechanism that I showed briefly before. And this has the potential to be a very efficient way to assemble molecules. And Pfizer and Weichs right now have a research collaboration ongoing. And some of those results will be published very soon. Similarly, the Pfizer medicinal chemistry group was very, were very interested in coupling these SP3 hybridized saturated heterocycles, and they uh, sponsored some work by Gary Molander's group, who also found that uh, slight modifications from the Weichs uh, reaction conditions would efficiently couple these two electrophiles. And this chemistry has been published and is now being used within, uh, within Pfizer. So lastly, I'd like to just uh, once again uh, summarize the take-home messages. Hopefully you've gotten out of this that the metal-catalyzed cross-coupling is still a very important transformation in the pharmaceutical industry, but it still relies predominantly on palladium. Hopefully you've seen that there's many advantages for base metals, both in terms of the practical usage of it, the impact on the environment, but also in the reactivity itself, that the base metals are often as reactive or more reactive than palladium and shouldn't be considered as a substitute for a second generation reaction, but actually as a first approach. And hopefully you've seen some examples of new modes of reactivity in which base metals can now offer up new disconnections to make different types of molecules in different ways. Lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge the people involved in the base metal catalysis efforts, both here and with our Pharma Non-Precious Metal Catalysis Alliance members, Beringer, Ingelheim, and Abbey, a non-competitive collaboration that's now entering its fourth year. And especially I'd like to acknowledge the chemists that, that performed the work on the examples that I showed. Two excellent chemists, Xu Yu and Javier Magano, and a, a very talented organometallic chemist, Sebastian Monfat. Chris, thanks so much for a great talk, a great discussion showing what's possible and uh, the great work that's being done in Pfizer. I have some great questions here, so I'm just going to jump right into them. The first question is, how do the levels of residual nickel compare with those normally seen with palladium catalyzed cross couplings? That's a real good question. And, and it's actually something that the chemists here were very concerned about. It's new type of chemistry and there was some concern about what, what are you going to see when you actually scale this thing up. Certainly with uh, iron, the levels, and, and copper, I think we know, we've seen enough of that, have enough experience with that to know that they tend to wash out very well. Nickel being more like palladium in its uh, characteristics than iron and copper is a little less known. And I would say that from what we've seen so far, nickel is efficiently removed from the reaction through very easy steps such as washing with different types of aqueous washes. I would also say that we haven't had enough experience yet to draw definitive conclusions how this is going to work across a whole range of catalysts and applications. So right now it looks like that nickel is going to be easier than palladium and that was consistent with the Genentech observations but I still think that we need to do a lot more work to say that definitively, and it would be really interesting if somebody were to do a specific study showing head-to-head -head comparisons of palladium versus nickel. Next question is, if there are effective nickel catalysts for cross-coupling, what is the driving force to develop iron variants, and does cobalt have a role to potentially play as a base metal as well? Iron has a lot of advantages for nickel. You know, it's, it's much, much cheaper. It's much less toxic. There's certainly no questions at the moment around you know, whether it might be a carcinogen. But it's also much more challenging chemistry. And you know, nickel is, let's say, only a slight shift away from palladium to get that to work. And in the near term, we have been able to make some conversions from palladium to nickel. And we'd like to see that type of chemistry develop further. But ultimately, I think down the line, when both nickel and iron have had as much effort put on designing catalysts as palladium has had over the last 30 years, we'd like to see that, that things begin to shift toward iron. So here's a, an, an interesting question. What's an acceptable balance of metal cost to ligand cost, especially when you're attempting to do an enantioselective transformation? 
that's a good question. Obviously, you can't have the ligand to be so complicated that it ends up being a very impactful cost. Generally speaking, for an anti-selective transformation, it is often the ligand that is the bigger component. And it really depends on you know where you're putting the transformation and how low you can get the catalyst loading. There's some very nice publications now coming out with iron and, and relatively what look like relatively straightforward ligands to make that are doing asymmetrical hydrogenations on ketones that look like they are, are practical to implement. And then we've seen there's also some nickel asymmetric hydrogenations that might be able to begin to replace things like rhodium with relatively simple uh, ligands. But in terms of the ratio of the two, I'm not sure I have a great answer for that. I think you have to look at the total cost and see how it uh, stacks up against you know, the cost of making the molecule itself. Yeah, so here's another good ratio question. In general, is there a set ratio of the amount of nickel versus palladium for equivalent reactions? I would say that you typically see that nickel is used at a higher loading than palladium. So in very early development and discovery, you'll see loadings in the sort of 1% to 5% range for palladium because there hasn't been a lot of optimization. And I think you could generally achieve the same numbers for nickel, especially now with better understanding of how to get the nickel T catalyst to enter the catalytic cycle. In some ways, there's one, one challenge is that you might have some side reactions with nickel that cause catalyst decomposition. But the other challenge is actually getting the pre-catalyst into the catalytic cycle. It's very similar to what it was for palladium several years ago. And what we saw was, was a large amount of effort to develop pre-catalysts that very efficiently enter the catalytic cycle. And as a consequence, you saw a much higher turnover. I think we will see that over time with nickel. But at the moment, nickel tends to be a bit higher loading. Let's say you might look at a 5% loading with nickel when palladium is at a 2 or 3%. But it really depends on the substrate, the catalyst, and how you're activating it. So with the proper development, you should be able to hit some very reasonable numbers at 1% or lower. Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service by the American Chemical Society as your professional source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.